the other title I would have for today is, Do You Want to Be Rescued? Do you want to be rescued? The reality is, is that some people don't want to be rescued out of what they're in. And sometimes we go to church and we, we think that, well, I'll do it someday. Someday I'll, I'll want to be free from that. But the reality is, is that God wants you to be rescued. He died on the cross to rescue you from sin, death, hell, and the grave. He, he, he wants to liberate you from that. But the reality is, is that God will wait until you want to be rescued. So if you're here today and you're kind of feeling like your life is really just struggling and you just don't know for sure why God isn't doing more, tell him you want to be rescued. Tell him you want to be set free. Tell him you want to, you want to live that new life that he brings to everyday life because I tell you what, Jesus Christ died not so that you and I would have to live in the, the, the painful walks of sinfulness, but he died on the cross that we might be able to walk in free, freedom from sin, freedom from the enemy, freedom from the struggles that we battle with in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Doesn't mean we'll be battle free, just know that when you battle, you will be able to win. So turn to Galatians chapter one. I want you to read verses four and five with me. It says this, uh, let's read three, excuse me, three, four, and five. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. What evil age? Your present one you're living in right now. He came to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll come and illuminate and cause us to see what is in your word, that we might be able to live a new life that you designed for us to live. Thank you that you've come to do a work in me and you've come to do a work in this congregation today. And Lord, I pray that there, our hearts are, and lives are, are ready for you to come in and do that. So Father, have your way in us and continue to do a powerful, powerful work in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. So we want you to know this morning from God's word, he says, Jesus Christ, verse four, who gave himself for our sin. Aren't you thankful that God was willing to pay your sin in full? So that when you do sin, you can go to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my thoughts. Forgive me of my words. Forgive me for my actions. I know it wasn't quite right and I didn't even feel like doing the right thing, but I ask you to forgive me. Aren't you thankful that God will once at that point say, yep, paid in full. But you got to ask. Some people don't feel like you got to ask God, but you do. That's why you go and talk to him on a daily basis. And like I said before, every day before you go to bed, settle all your accounts before you go to bed. Go to him and say, Lord, this day is already done. I can't go back and change anything, but I want you to cleanse me and forgive me and wash me clean. That way, when you come to church on Sunday, you're not carrying a baggage load of you. Boom, 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 boom. You're carrying all these things of all the week thinking, yep, yeah, I'm just a poor old sinner. No, you're not. You're, you're redeemed. You're pay, Jesus paid a price. If you're his son or you're his daughter, he's given you life. And that life is not meant to be carrying around all your sin. That life is meant to be having the life of God inside of you explode and live through you so that you can overcome daily. You can overcome on a daily basis rather than wait till Sunday and show up and try to overcome then. So you want to do that daily work that God wants. You want to allow God to come in and do that, rescue you daily. Why? Because he knows how evil this day is. And I'll be honest with you, you, me, no matter, Billy Graham, doesn't matter who you put in the list, nobody's a match for sin. Nobody. Jesus was the only person who was a match for sin, and he won, and I'm glad he did, because he won, we get to win in this present age. Quickly turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. If you're a visitor with us today, I always encourage people to bring their Bibles with 
simply because if you don't, I can tell you anything and you'll probably believe me. And you might say, well, preachers don't lie. Yes, they do. They don't always tell you the truth, so therefore you got to jump on them. Not literally, but you got to go and talk to them and say, God's word says this and you said this. What's that mean? Hopefully we'll be uh, on, what happened? Are we there? There we go. I know my voice wasn't that quiet, so I knew something happened. But God definitely wants to come and change our life. He doesn't save us from our sin only to leave you the same way you were. He transforms you. He changes you from the inside out. Coming to church is wonderful, but what do you do the other six and three-fourths of the week? Is that just as honorable as you sitting here? Because if it's not, you're wasting your time here. Because obviously one day a week hasn't done it for you. And I'm not going to tell you to stay home, but I could. But you've got to learn to listen to what God says every day of the week. It is vitally, vitally important that you and I learn to hear God's voice every single day. Every day he wants to talk to you. Every day he has things he wants you to know. And if you don't have time to listen, quit your job. It'd be one of the best things you could do. Quit being so busy. Quit doing everything else but listening. Because when I don't listen, all it is is I'm like a horse with a bit in my mouth and God's saying, Jeff, come this way. No, I'm going to go my way and you're going to come with because I might need you down the road. And people grit their teeth and they just pull God and you don't think you can pull God, but he basically lets go of the reins. He says, okay, have it your way. McDonald's, have it your way. You want it your way? Go ahead. But the reality is, is that God is up there ready to say, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna back you up everything you need. I've got everything you want, everything you could imagine. I've got it all and I'm ready to back you up. All you gotta do is let me lead you. Everything. Not one day you're going to miss anything because God's got everything. He purchased it all. He paid it in full. That when I go to him, I can receive forgiveness. Here's the best part about forgiveness. When we go to God and say, Lord, forgive me for my thoughts against so-and-so. Forgive me about saying those things about my pastor. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> no, but you, you go and you, you begin to talk to him. And it's like all of a sudden, wait a minute. When I go and confess those sins, his blood literally covers my sin, never ever to be brought up ever again. Amen. Ever, not even on the day of judgment. It's not gonna brought up, you know why? Because God's blood did a powerful, amazing work that absolutely has the ability to help you and I be free from sin. So when we talk about being free from something today, God literally wants to liberate you. He liberates us from the very thing that's trying to destroy us. And so he wants to transform us. He wants to make us into something that we weren't without his hands. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, a very familiar passage of Scripture. But if you look at it with me, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us. And you know why he does that? You know why God demonstrated his love? Because he's going to watch you demonstrate your love for him. Not just talk about it. Not just come to church and say, I love Jesus, yes I do, I love Jesus, how about you? No, it's not gonna be like that. What's gonna happen is, is you're, when you and I walk out these doors today, we either demonstrate that we love God by doing what he asks, or we push him away and say, I love you only when I need you. Talk to you later, and I go my way. And God says, no, I, I didn't die on the cross for that kind of deal. I died on the cross that when we say we love each other, we walk together. We walk with everything and all the power we have. And so you and I, like people in the scriptures, you will face troubled days. You will face mountains. You will face difficulties. But guess what? When you've got the biggest daddy in the house around, you ain't got no problems crossing that mountain no matter how big or difficult it is. 
You've got everything at your disposal. Jesus Christ demonstrated that, and he, so he demonstrated his love. Think about it. A guy that's never done anything wrong, never disobeyed his parents, never did nothing wrong in his thought, word, or deed, decides to say yes to his heavenly father to walk a road that you and I wouldn't walk. He walked down that road carrying his own cross, whipped, beaten, beard pulled out, spit upon, ridiculed, just absolutely, completely tried to destroy him, only to be brought to the place where they nailed him in his hands and his feet on, onto a cross, lifted it up, dropped it in its hole so that everything hurts. And he looked at the people that did it and he said, don't hold this against them, Lord. If that's the kind of forgiveness that he can give towards us, what do you think you're capable of? More than what you could dream. More than you, you, what you could ever imagine. Why? Because the one inside of you needs to continue to grow. It needs to begin to affect. It affects what I do. It affects what I think. It affects what I want, what I say with, what I look at with my eyes, what I listen to. It begins to affect everything about my life. Why? So that I can learn to protect. How you doing on your egg? Still, still one piece? So far, anybody else? Where's, who's got the other eggs? Yours okay? Mind if I come and sit in your lap? No, I'm just kidding. See, if, when you make things difficult, people still have to learn to protect. You see, when, when the storm comes, what does a hen do? She puts her wings over her. What is the father a picture of? It's like a mother hen over his kids. He can't wait to protect you even in the midst of the storm. And so the reality is that God wants to come and, and protect you even when things get difficult. But you and I have to learn to stay under his covering in the midst of what's going on so we can enjoy the benefits of what he purchased. I can't enjoy the benefits of what we purchased if I don't protect what he's given me. You see, if what God has given me, I'm reckless with it, I don't take care of it, what's going to happen? It's not going to work like it's supposed to. Because I've chosen to misuse it in a way that wasn't meant to be used. That's even like the, the gifts of the Spirit. Prophecy, uh, um, word, tongue interpretation, tongues, um, uh, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, all of those things. They're all gifts that God has given to the church. And yes, they've been abused. They've been misused. But that's not God's fault. The reality is, is that when God wants to use them and you and me, we should be willing to protect them in such a way that we use them correctly. Because we have something God has given us that we need to learn to use in the right manner so it reflects him. It reflects who he is. And so that's why it's one of those things that's great to be used by God, but you gotta learn to keep you out of the way and learn to do whatever it is God's called us to do. So God literally wants to continue to transform us he never will leave us the same. He'll always want to change us. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Very, another very familiar passage of Scripture for many of you maybe. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 17 through 21. Watch this. This is cool. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. So how do you get in him? How do you get in Christ? You'll humble yourself. You surrender. How do you get in jail? You surrender to the guy that puts you there. Right? If a policeman shows up at your house and say, Jeff, you're coming with me. Okay. I'm not going to probably argue. Why? Because he's got a greater authority than I do to come and put me in a place where I am captivated. I am limited by what, what, what surrounds me. And because I'm limited, therefore, I can only do certain things. So when I am in Christ, God begins to set boundaries around me that protect me. 
Those boundaries aren't there to stop me from living life. Those boundaries are there to begin to set me in a place where I can fully function like God designed me to because I'm not letting the world and all the sin and all the junk of life come in and affect what God has given me. So if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. I'm going to set apart the old way of living only now to begin to do the new way of living. The old is gone and the new has come. Why? Because God didn't need your old you. He doesn't need the old way of thinking. He doesn't need the old way of saying things. He doesn't need the old person that you and I are. were. He needs the new work. Why? Because when he puts life inside of me, remember I always talk about life and it's down here in your gut. It's not up here in your head. If it was up here, you wouldn't have to renew your mind. But God tells us we had to renew our mind. Why? Because it doesn't think like God. So now I begin to listen to my gut. I begin to listen to the spirit of God down inside of me. And out of that comes life. God is all about life. He's not about death because he laid in a tomb. He overcame death, right? So we got to be careful of what we say and what we do and that we aren't uh, speaking death over people. We're speaking life over people. He says, therefore, if any was in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. We are brought to God by Jesus Christ. And what did God put in you? What did he put in you? He put Jesus Christ. For what reason? Watch. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting men's sins against them. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. So here's the deal. I now have a, a life inside of me, Jesus Christ. And once I ask Jesus Christ to come in, I now become his messenger his ambassador. I become the one that begins to go around telling people about Jesus Christ because if I don't take something that God has given me and begin to give it away, it's not gonna do anybody any good. So the reason he got saved was not only to be saved inside of us and have Jesus Christ live in us, he says, now I've got a message of reconciliation, bringing God and man together through Jesus Christ, and now I'm going to send you out as ambassadors to go and do that message. The worst thing that we can do is literally stop people from being messengers from Jesus Christ. There's a growing time. There's a learning time, because if you don't know what you're talking about, you probably don't want to be talking about it. People will pick up a fake real quick. Do you know that in a banking system, they handle so, many, so much of the real money that when a fake comes through, they can pick it up just like that? I mean, it's just quick. They don't handle the fake stuff. They handle the real stuff. And so the reality is God wants so much of his realness inside of you that you and I can learn to catch a fake. So he says... That God is reconciled, in verse 19, to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We become a part of God so much that we are now righteous in our spirit. Our flesh, our mind, and everything else takes time to work on that, doesn't it? But we have to come to that reconciliation. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree so that we might die to sin. <laughs> How'd you do this last week? Did you have a sinful week or a happy week? Come on, don't be so tired you can't respond. Wake it up. Did you have a sinful week? 
proud of it. You know, God had a, not much of an influence. I just went my own way, did my own thing. Or did you have a victorious week where when sin came, you said no. When sin wanted to, the enemy wanted to creep into your life, you said, I resist that in the name of Jesus. You begin to resist it. Why? Because you realize that Jesus died on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Die to sin, live for righteousness. Right standing, doing the right thing. God wants you and I to live. He wants us to be alive. But while we're alive, he wants us to do the right thing, not the wrong thing. And so I've got to learn to die to the things that God says are not okay. And I've got to learn to live to the things that God says is okay. And let me just say it this way. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to go ahead and do whatever you want. And any day you think you can, you're taking a nail and you're piercing him again. You're nailing him right back to the cross. You're taking the cat of nine tails and you're ripping it across his back. And the masters at it would rip it so it caught. And then they would go, Roomp, and it would just rip his body open. The staff, that, the, the, the crown of thorns that they put on his head, it was too sharp to press. So they took their staff and they beat it on so that it would literally poke into his is brain. And I don't know about you, but every time I think about what Jesus Christ did for me, how dare I think that I have a right to do whatever I want. My life is not my own. I was bought at a price. Therefore, God designed me to honor him. But you know what? I didn't always think like that, even as a Christian. God had to grow me up God had to take me from where I was and begin to grow me. And if I give God liberty, I will grow every year of my life. I will grow more and more in love with him, and I'll grow less and less in love with the world. I'll grow more in love with him, and I'll grow less and less, where all of a sudden, the world does not have the attraction it used to have. Oh, this used to be fun. Oh, we used to talk about the good old days and how horrible things we did and got away with it. Nobody thought they knew or whatever the case might be. Yet God is up there saying, one day I hope you'll choose me. One day I hope you'll choose what I want you to do with your life. And I want to encourage you today, Jesus Christ bore my sin and yours in his body on a tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds we have been healed. And isn't it interesting that God can heal me in my physical body as well as take away my sin? He can do both. Okay, let's keep moving. Luke 24. Luke 24. Luke 24. I don't know, but something about this caught my eye today, and I think it's vitally, vitally important that we remember this. Luke chapter 24 Verse 5, it says this, In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to him, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. This was after Jesus was resurrected. And after Jesus was resurrected, these women came and wanted to verify with their own eyes. And they came to the tomb. They came to the tomb, and yes, it verified that he wasn't there, but they came to the tomb, and there was two men standing there, and their message was this. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Let me just tell you this. In life today, you'll never find God in dead things. You'll never find God in dead places. You'll never find God in the places where he doesn't live and he doesn't hang out and he doesn't move. Why? Because God doesn't need dead things to get his name across people's lives. God, when he sent his son Jesus to go through life, what took place? He walked up to the blind man and he prayed and his eyes were opened. He walked up to the lame man and he could rise up and walk even though he'd been lame for 38 years. He could take the demoniac. 
I won't pick on anybody on that one. <laughs> he picked up, he took, came to the demoniac and the de- demon, even the demon says, why do you curse me before my time? Why have you come to torment me? And he, he, that demon had to come out of that man and leave. Why? Because he's all about life. The very thing that are, things that are dying in you today, God wants to pull out of you and insert the life and the breath of God so that you can begin to live, you can begin to grow, you can begin to do things you can't do by yourself. He literally wants to transform us and change us. Why? Because there's a sick and dying world out there. I love what Leonard Ravenhill says, and I'm not going to get tired of ever quoting him. He says, one of the most tragic deals in the world is a sick and dying church trying to reach a sick and dying world. If you can't be healthy with God, what do you got to offer? If you can't have the life of God, what do you got to offer? More of you? More of me? No, you don't need more of me. You and I both need more of God. He wants to bring life, but you'll never find life in dead places. You've got to learn to transform your life that what you used to do, you don't do anymore and you don't go to them because they don't bring you life. Stop trying to live off the dead stuff of life. But don't be afraid to eat beef, okay? (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Obviously, beef is dead stuff and we live off it, you know? Just saying. (laughs) That's natural food. I'm just saying it's spiritual stuff. Don't, don't go to the psychic and think that they're going to fix you. Go to Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're dealing with demons today, go to Jesus Christ because you can know you can be set free. It says in his word. If you're down and you're out, Jesus can deliver you. If you're caught up in addictions and things of life that maybe nobody knows but you're caught up in that, don't go to, don't go to everywhere else. Go to Jesus. He's got the answer. He's got everything you and I need. You'll never find God in dead places. I thought that was so interesting. He said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's alive. John chapter 10, verse 10. Very familiar passage. Almost done. John chapter 10, verse 10. It says this. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I have come that you might have life to the full. Can I have my eggs back? How'd you do? Still only one piece. Well done. We got one over here? I think it's cooked. You think it's cooked? (laughs) Oh, your hands were that hot. Ah, I got gotcha. you. Well done, well done. Let's see, where's my other eggies? Oh, weren't, yeah, oh, we got one back here, don't we? Do. Oh, yeah, here we go. Cool. I should have just let you take them home and you can cook them yourself. And you did really well, too. Awesome. It's half cooked. Oh, okay. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So all the eggs came back protected. Even though we worshiped, even though we prayed, even though we greeted each other, everybody was able. <laughs> they are. They're all warm. <laughs> it's like, wow, if I needed to warm up, it's here, man. That's pretty cool. And I don't know about you, but I really believe that... Uh, Jesus Christ came to ask us to be responsible for what he's given us. And if something is valuable to us, we'll make sure that nothing else ever comes and takes it away. Don't ever let anybody take Jesus Christ from you. Don't let your job, don't let your time, don't let your enjoyable times, all your fun things that you like to do. I'll never forget uh, a time in my life when I wanted to do certain things, and I actually was on the road going to do something I thought I would really enjoy, and the Lord told me to go home and turn around and not do it. It wasn't a bad thing. It's just that God was beginning to rearrange some things in me because of what was coming ahead. 
And when God begins to rearrange and change your life, I want to encourage you, let him do it. Because if you don't, you might mishandle and break something that's very valuable to him. And it's hard to tell somebody, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when you're not faithful. That's what the Bible says. When the master came back and he looked at what the servants did, the one that had five talents, he gained five more. The one that had two talents, he gained two more. But the one that had one talent went and hid it, never did nothing with it. And when the master came back, he said, you wicked and lazy servant, depart from me into the place of eternal fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They all had the same gift in different amounts. They were all servants of the same master. Two of them went to heaven, one of them went to hell because they were lazy and wicked. Wicked, once again, comes from the word wicker, twisted furniture. Wicker furniture, twisted. So what the lazy one did is they took what God gave, twisted it to make himself comfortable, only to do what he wanted rather than what was designed for. Your life and my life are like the master that has given us something, and what are we doing with it? If we're not doing what we're designed to, we are what the Bible calls wicked and lazy. And you don't want that kind of response from God. You want to be the servant that says, look, master, what you gave me, I've doubled. I've gained interest while you were away. And the only way God can do that is if you let him have your life. You want to sing that song? Carol's going to sing for us a song in closing. Man, it's hot in here. Can you open a window? I mean, isn't it? Or is it just me? Okay, it's just me. But anyway, she's going to sing a song for us in closing. Callie, this mic. Yeah. 
amazing message that God took a curtain that was so thick and as soon as he said it is finished it ripped from the middle of the temple so that you and I can walk right into the presence of God you and I don't have to go to a church and go talk to a priest like they did in the Old Testament you don't have to bring sacrifices of animals thank God I don't have to do that but I can boldly go right before him right no, even where you're at, in your own room, in your own house, wherever you are, you can boldly uh, uh, you know, approach him. I don't know about you, but what a privilege it is to know a God who loves us yet so much, but yet is so powerful. Amen. If anybody needs prayer or something before you got questions, don't be afraid to ask us before you leave today. And if, you, uh, um, if there's something you felt God was tugging on your heart today, don't ignore that. Listen to that. Talk about it with somebody because God didn't tug on your heart because everything was going just right. He's tugging on your heart because he wants to begin to do some things. And it's not bad. It's not always bad when God changes things. He just says, I'm done with this and I need this, so here we go. Let's shift. When you go get a new car, you don't take the old car and throw it in the dump. You're still driving it, right? It's still worth something. It means it's still a good car, but you just want a new one. Nothing wrong with that at all. So you're still doing the same thing. God never does things just because things are bad. He always changes things because he has different purposes coming. So God's blessing to you. It's uh, Joanna and Odin, welcome home. Amen. Yes. Did you, we, we want warm weather, but not too warm yet. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring it on. Yeah. Yeah. And we got a bunch of kids back from before. Good to see you all, you guys. Yes. Oh, yeah. The, the lilies, Easter lilies are five bucks a piece if you want to take one home.